Okay, so just a little bit more about airway stuff. Um, this is a nice little oxygen flow meter. This thing on the end is called a swivel green flow meter. But in terms that everybody um, in the healthcare profession is going to know it as is a it's a Christmas tree. Um, so this is what, if somebody tells you to go find a green Christmas tree, this is uh, what they're looking for. And this is specifically for oxygen. Air is um, yellow. Okay. Um, so we would use a, a nasal cannula for up to six liters. Uh, we could use a simple mask. A simple mask is generally um, just this simple mask with um, oxygen tubing down to this. Generally, we only use it in recovery. Uh, we don't use it up on the floor. Um, if we do need to place the patient on the mask, we'll put the patient on a Veni mask. This is what a Veni mask looks like. It has all sorts of nice little um, thingamabobs that come with it. You know how much oxygen you're giving by the thingamabob. So if the doctor tells you to um, place the patient on a 24% uh, mask, you're going to pick the blue one, put it on here. I know that it's 24% because on the end here it says 24%, and it also tells me how much to put the oxygen flow meter at. So 24%, I'm going to place this up to... Four liters. Now, if the patient still isn't in my order is to titrate to keep the oxygen um, to 90%, I might have to use all of my little thingamabobs here. Um, so this one is going to be 50%, and this is going to be 8 liters. So after 50%, after this orange one, I'm, I know that I'm having a little bit of a problem. And I might have to switch to my handy dandy non rebreather. My handy dandy non rebreather has got the reservoir mask in it. So, with this handy dandy non rebreather, it kind of depends on your um, hospital. But don't ever put this on a patient without this reservoir being inflated. How do you inflate it, you ask? Well, all you do is place your two fingers over this right here and fill it up. Okay, now it's ready to be placed on the patient so that when the patient is breathing out, the um, carbon dioxide flows out, but then they breathe in the oxygen that's coming through this tube, but also they take, can take a deep breath from this oxygen that's filling the reservoir. So they get 100% or something very close to that. This isn't going to work for all respiratory distress patients because um, some of them cannot maintain their own respirations and that is when we would assist them. So if the patient's um, respiratory rate falls to a dangerously low level, say 7 or 8, and um, or they're not being effective in their respirations, their respiratory rate now is, I don't know, 30 or 40, and their SATs are 30 or 40, um, actually it won't pick up 30 or 40, you know that you have to assist their ventilations with an AMBU bag. Um, this is the blob mask, there's the um, uh, balloon, and then this is, again, a reservoir that's going to hold oxygen. Um, when we put this, when we use this, the patient may or may not be conscious, and what we are doing is assisting them. If they still have their own respiratory effort, we're just going to, when they take a deep breath in, we're going to assist them. We aren't going to put the whole thing in because their lung might not be that big. And, and actually, with a patient um, who is a COPD patient, they might you might actually cause a pneumothorax because their lung tissue is a little bit more friable. Or an infant or toddler, um, their, their lung tissue is a little bit frail. So you don't want to force a huge amount of air in. You want to support their respirations and give them what they need. Okay? Give a little positive pressure. Um, so when we put the AMBU bag on, 
and we assist the patient's respirations. Um, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to get the patient in the right position. So this patient is having a little respiratory distress. So the first thing that I'm going to do is put the patient down. Um, and I'm going to take the pillow out. Now look and see that I have opened up this airway. The other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to put the ankum right back. Okay? I'm going to hook up this to the oxygen. All the way open. The blob mass goes on so the pointy end is over the nose. If I'm doing this myself, I'm going to use a C and my hands are big. Um, sometimes you may need an E. An E is good because you place that pinky behind this mandibular notch and pull that jaw forward. Um, so if I'm if I'm somebody else is using the bag for me, this is my hand positioning. If I'm doing it myself, I'm going to dig these fingers in underneath this jawline and pull that jaw up so that all of this is as open as it possibly can be. I'm going to put firm pressure on his face, pull that up. With each respiration, I should see chest rise. Now, I am at the same time going to be filling that belly up. So, please be, please be aware that you will most likely, um, after 10, 15, 20 minutes of bagging a patient like this, their abdomen is going to be full of air and it's got to go someplace. They will may want to vomit. Make sure that your suction is ready and you have gloves on. Um, I think that's it for right now. Okay, so if you are at the point that your patient needs to be intubated, you are not going to intubate them. But you will be doing a couple things. One of the first things that you're going to do is you're going to make sure that there's suction available. I have a yank hour suction. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to pull the bed away from the wall. Okay, because the physician or whoever the healthcare provider is who is doing the intubation is going to need to be in behind you. You're going to take the head of the bed off. You're going to make sure that the bed is in high position, that it's waist height for the health care provider. Another thing that you can do to be uh, to get the get everything ready is have the endotracheal tube ready. And um, they may ask you for the laryngoscope. The, the laryngoscope comes in two pieces. This is the blade. This is the handle. It goes together. Sometimes it'll go together the wrong way. This is the wrong way. It goes together like this. Can you see that handle? So it goes together just like this. And when it goes together correctly, there's a little light bulb here that's going to illuminate um, the patient's vocal cords that the, patient, the doctor will see. So the doctor will then uh, haul the patient up insert this the light is looking at the vocal cords they'll take the tube and they'll place the tube okay but i'm, I'm not going to do that uh, 100 percent so now the tube is in and you would then attach the bag and start bagging the patient you would auscultate breath sounds Get a chest x-ray, do the end tidal CO2 to a confirmed placement within the lung. If you only hear uh, lung sounds on one side, you know you've intubated one lung. You want to back it up and get it just to above the carina so that, you're in, so that that uh, ventilator is oxygenating both lungs, not just one. Because uh, a lot of times they'll go down that right main stem bronchus. And again, the... Suction, if they're vomiting, you're going to be able to suction whatever's done. Now, once that endotracheal tube is down, they'll generally set the patient up with a uh, closed system uh, suction, put the patient on the ventilator, and off the ICU he goes.
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about crash carts. This is a crash cart in an emergency department. Um, here's the crash cart. This is the lock that keeps all these drawers locked. Uh, when we open this up, the lock will come off. This um, big rod comes out and the drawers then open up. We need to keep it locked to make sure that all the equipment stays in place. Somebody's accountable for locking it up, making sure that all the outdates for the medications and the equipment are taken care of and replaced as necessary. Um, it looks like kind of a wreck, doesn't it? Well, there's a couple reasons for this because there's stuff all over the place. Um, most crash carts, the drawers will be labeled like these ones are, adult meds, intubation equipment, IVs, AMBUs. Um, there's a little bit of pediatric supplies on this, but um, for the most part, places like to have a separate pediatric cart, crash cart with um, pediatric supplies on it separately. Um, there's some books up here. There, uh, this IV drip book. There is um, a, a code documentation sheet. These are pads for the um, pediatric. Um, pads or cardiac monitor pads. These are pads for the defibrillator pacemaker. There's an endotracheal tube um, uh, tube holder, paper for the um, defibrillator. We have um, the fiber, fiber optic laryngoscope with the blades. A sandbag. A sandbag is always helpful in a cold situation. Um, I'm going to turn this around. We have portable suction. Why do we need portable suction? Well, sometimes there's a code in registration and the elevator and the cafeteria. We don't necessarily have a suction um, there available. Um, so here's some portable suction. We can just take the crash cart down, use the portable suction down there. There's usually a sharps container on there. And um, back here, there's a backboard. Okay. On the other side, I'm going to take that off. Um, we see um, down here is an oxygen tank, and somebody when they when they do their check of the crash cart, they have to make sure that there is enough oxygen in here, and that this turns on. Um, these are some extra and blue bags, a couple different sizes, and our defibrillator. Um, as we went over in the the um, PowerPoint, there's different kinds of defibrillators. This is um, a Zoll defibrillator. This is an external defibrillator. Um, it also has cardiac monitor capability. And that you need to have this on if you're going to do pacing or um, even defibrillating. Your, your patient should also be on this monitor. Um, the pads are here on the side. Um, these also remember how to do this okay so now when we take the big pad off um, these are now pediatric size okay and these slide back right right there if I put it on the right way okay so this actually is um, something that's new when I first became a nursing student all the defibrillators were monophasic and what monophasic means is that the current would travel from one pad to the other. Uh, you place these on the, the patient's chest, and everybody, I'm clear, you're clear, we all clear, and then we would shock. The one current would go from this paddle to this paddle. Then, and we would use two, three, 400 joules, depending on the size of the patient and um, whether or not anything was working. Well, we, somebody figured out that if we used a current that went from one pad to the other, that's okay, but if we use a pad that sends a current from both pads at the same time and crosses, that will, will um, be more effective and um, you can use less energy. So um, this is called a biphasic defibrillator. Um, I'm going to pull this in and hopefully you can see it. 
So what we're going to do, a um, couple things. If you want to monitor it, you're going to turn this up to monitor. If you want to pace, see pace is green, we're going to use these two things down here. So let's turn it on. It's not going to do much. There it is, okay? Um, so we can change the lead here. We can change the size of the ECG, although nobody's hooked up right now. Um, this will alarm if the um, alarm limits are reached, if it, the heart rate is too um, high or too low. Um, so we can suspend those and make them shut up for a minute. We can also hit uh, record and this will set out a um, reading continuously. Now when we want to shock, look over here. This tells me what we're going to do. I can turn that to defib because that's number one. Number two is I select how much energy I want. I go up to one or 200, whatever I want to do. 120, 200. It's, it won't let me go any higher because I don't have any leads on. Then I charge number two and then I shock. And I can use these paddles or I can actually use these pacemaker pads. Um, these pacemaker pads, this is this defibrillator is also an external pacemaker. Um, so what happens is So now this is removed from one of the paddles, and I just hook it up. When I open this up, there's two paddles. They're patches. They are this big. We generally like to place them on the front side of the chest, towards the middle, and on the back, so that that is going um, anterior and posteriorly. That charge is flowing back and forth. We can. Uh, defibrillate using these we can also pace using these I kind of like these better because if you get a rhythm back um, after you defibrillate and but it's not if it's a bradycardia and it's not um, what it needs to be you can then set this to pace so now this will pace using these patches um, generally <laughs> generally we set these, um, you'll need to set the milliamps and the um, beats per minute. I always like to start out, and I always suggest, if, if doctor will take my suggestion, that we start out at 60 and 60. I feel like that's a good number, and it's easy to remember. So 60 amps and 60 beats per minute. And then you just go up or down, depending on the patient's um, comfort, depending on the patient's um, symptoms depending on the patient's overall status and you give them the least amount of energy for the most amount of good so if um, I'm pacing this patient I'm gonna turn this off um, if I'm pacing this patient and I'm using 60, but the 60 milliamps, the patient is very uncomfortable. I might turn it down to uh, 45 or 50. If it continues to pace, they really don't need that higher level of energy. So 45 or 50 might be good for this patient. Also keep in mind that if you are doing a resuscitation or pacing, you are definitely doing um, vital signs more often than every four hours. Um, and a patient can't really stay on an external um, pacemaker for very long because it is uncomfortable and because you are shocking them with a small amount of electricity over and over and over um, and that's they don't like that people don't like that um, nurses don't like that because it's very uncomfortable um, you also might find a magnet 
a large magnet. Um, sometimes if a patient has a pacemaker and um, it's not doing what it should be doing, they'll place the large magnet over the pacemaker to shut it off temporarily. And I kind of think that's it.